Hello and welcome to another episode of IV Backed. I am so excited to have you guys here because today is a really good day for Kickstarter, in my opinion. There are some awesome games that have come out. Um, some days I'm, or some weeks, I'm just like, oh, I'll look at what's out there. But I've actually been looking at a few of these games for a while. Um, so I'm and, and talking to some of the creators about them for a while. So I'm really excited to, to dive into this one. Um, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, last week, we said we were going to do a giveaway during our Scarface and uh, Forest of Pangaea. I think I got it that time. I had some some help pronouncing that on our last stream. Um, and Ericon Wars. So, hey, what's up, Matt? Um, all right. So, this was the, um, the giveaway. We decided to do tree jokes. And by we, I mean me, because you guys probably hated that. But I, I enjoyed looking through them. Uh, and there were there were a good number of comments there about different tree jokes. So we are going to go ahead and do a selection. This is going to be for a Moonraker's base, excuse me, Moonraker's Kickstarter exclusive game, or one of the Veiled Fate posters. So whoever wins gets to choose. It has to be something at an attempt at a joke. It doesn't necessarily have to be funny because you know that's eye of the beholder, ear of the listener. You know, whatever. One of those things. Richard Lawton. Some of these Kickstarter. Oh, gosh. Not going to read that. But Richard, thank you so much for commenting. I'm a little on the fence on whether that counts, as I did say, keep it PG. Uh, but, you know, um, I'm going to do it anyway. Go ahead and comment. Uh, join the Discord if you're not here in there. Direct message me or message us on social media, and we will get you a game. Um, sorry for any children that may be watching. Um, all right, let's jump in, shall we? Um, so before I actually, before I jump in, you're going to hear some noises in the background, and that is a massive 3D printer setup I have over here. I'm going to do a behind the scenes video on this eventually because I find it really interesting, but we are in the middle of printing tons of miniatures for our next game, Mythic Mischief. So if you hear some whirring noises, some other, you know, I don't know what, how to describe a 3D printer noise. If you've heard a 3D printer, you know what I'm talking about. But it's kind of loud sometimes. So that's what that is. Um, I'm really excited to, to show you guys. There are 13 miniatures in every one of those games. And so I have been printing like a madman. I was up till 2.30 starting a print last night. So, um, but yeah, let's, let's dive on in because I'm excited about this first game. And I want to hear what you guys think about it. Um, let me bring it up. All right, so first, we have Valor and Villainy, Ludwig's, Ludwig's, Ludwig's Labyrinth, Labyrinth. I'm really good at pronouncing things. I know you guys already know that, um, but I have been excited about this, except for the fact that I have not played the base game. And you say, well, how can you be excited for a game uh, when you haven't played the game that this game is expanding upon? It's a standalone expansion. It's not, you don't have to have it in order to, to play this game. Um, but you know, you get to know people in the industry and you just get excited about everything that they make because you start believing in a company um, and, and Skybound is one of those companies that that we're just going to back anything they come out with at this point. Um, I've got the massive Tidal Blades game over there um, and like that's on me and Zach's very high on the playlist once we're, we're hanging out again, which is basically now we're both vaccinated. So I think we're gonna start to get together and play games. So that's going to be hitting the table for us very, very soon. But honestly, James and, and other people on his team have been just so welcoming to us in the industry and helped us with advice and come on Ivy games weekly. And so that's number one, like, okay, I'm going to look at the page, right? But they just run really, really great campaigns. And we're going to talk about, um, we're going to talk about why this is a great campaign. Um, they're at 120,000 basically on a 50,000 goal. This is day one. So they're doing great. Um, <laughs> Chris Chesney says, just wait until Austin realizes he can print his own dice. Uh, Sebastian, good to see you. Kevin, good to see you. Sean, good to see you. Thank you guys all for joining. Um, all right. So diving into this campaign, um, actually one of the skybound games actually it was tidal blades was one of the the main inspirations that we looked at a lot when we were planning moonrakers page and so uh, i'm very familiar with that page i think this page is great it's not quite as artistic maybe as as um tidal blades was um but this is there's a lot really of good things going on here and a lot of a lot of thought put into the campaign um first off three created two backed skybound games you guys know how i always talk about that james has backed an obscene number of games um and so if you go in here, and I know no one's really going to go that deep into things, but if you go to this, Druid City Games, 
I am curious how many is backed. Backed 1,010 projects. So normally I'd be like, that's not enough projects. But having known the team behind this, I knew, of course, that that was not a complaint that I was going to have. Now, would I recommend to them that, hey, just go and back some more games on Skybound account for the people that don't know? Probably. Like, that's that's probably not a bad idea. Um, but they they support the industry very, very well and, and deserve that recognition for sure. All right. So Valor and Villainy. Um, there's a game that came before this under the same title with a different subheading. Um, and it was, I believe, a one versus many, kind of like an Imperial Assault where you have one person playing the bad guys and some people playing the good guys and you go head to head. Um, that was popular for a few years. It is It is declined in popularity. And I think that is one of the the things that um, has been brought up about the game um, and, and not that it's a bad game. It's, it's a great game. It has an eight on BGG, um, which is really wonderful if you follow BGG. Um, so getting into this, they do a really good job of one. There's just a, a very rough what's in the box, some exciting things, got some miniatures, got kind of a look at some of the components, which is that this dungeon is modular and it changes as you play, which I love. It's really cool. But this little section right here is what I want to talk about, which is the fully standalone, fully cooperative, Cross compatible with V1 and V, uh, V, <laughs> V and V1. There we go. I got it out. And one to six player with solo mode. So this is not really designed. There's some, there's some white tech or uh, black text on a white background. You guys know I talk about that a good bit. I may have put this in a design section, but this, these green check marks really draw your eye when you're going down here and are so important because it, it, it doesn't fix because there's nothing broken about the other game, but it calls out some things about this game that are very different than the game that already exists, um, that it's fully cooperative. You don't have to play against one of your friends. Not one person is randomly out. Uh, it's fully standalone. You don't need the other game to play this game. Um, one to six players is a great player count. It's hard to get a good game with six players and cross compatible with V and V1, which is great because then you aren't just throwing away all the other stuff you've already invested in this game. You you have benefit of having those other games when you buy this game. So it, it's almost like a continuation where you want to have this game if you have those other games. And so I think that's, uh, yeah. I think that's great. Um, going back to my 3D printing, Matt says the new level of print and play. I think when you take the term too seriously, yeah, literally printing it, 3D printing it. Um, all right. Cool beans. All right. So Lud Lud Ludwig's Ludwig's Labyrinth is a one to six co-op play one to six player co-op adventure game. It can be played over 16 missions as legacy style campaign or as a challenging one off free play games. Like I said, I might have designed this just because it's important information that it's legacy or just one off, which is great. I think that's really wonderful. But they do touch on that pretty well later in the campaign, as we'll see. Um, and I'm going to. One second. Got a note that I want to bring up. All right. So. Um, yeah, it's really important that that text is really important. So I wish that it was a little bit more designed, but then they have really, really wonderful call outs. And, and this is an interesting thing. There's there's a lot of different ways to kind of call out different things about your game. You can call out mechanics. You can call out actual gameplay, as in this is the breakdown of the turn, or you can call out fun moments. And, they, and they've done it a couple different ways on this page. And I really, really like this uh, approach. So this is just the calling out what is fun. Level ups on every turn. Navigate comedic multi-choice events. If you've played Gloomhaven, you know that you get like the road cards and the city cards. You have multi-choice events. I imagine this is somewhat similar. Um, some of the reviews spoke very, very highly of this mechanic. Or mechanic feature? I call it a feature. Um, and so I like that a lot. Um, unlock interesting new surprises each game and create hilarious and powerful combos. Those are not necessarily mechanics. They're just like, this is some fun moments, right? And so that... I like that they're doing that so early in the campaign. You, if you've watched any of our playtesting videos or talk uh, just about how we design games, we're always talking about chasing the fun. And so if you're you're talking about what the fun is, you're not just throwing components at them, right? This game has miniatures. Usually with a game of miniatures, it's just like minis, 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 minis. That's all you see at the top of the page. It's like, what's in the box? It's great. Like, buy this expansion. Like, But like they they took the time to talk about the fun. And, and so people, if you watch the show, you know that I'm always like gameplay higher, put gameplay higher. I think gameplay and what is fun higher are interchangeable for me. Like if you have this higher and then talk about gameplay a little bit lower, I'm, I'm going to be happy because this, this gets me an idea of what I'm going to be doing and why I would be interested in playing this game. I love upgrading. I love 
dynamic choices about how I'm going to make my character unique, especially if I'm working with a team because it's like I need to go into strength because they're going in intellect or something similar to that. I don't I haven't played this game, so I don't know. Um, but I love those dynamic choices around the table. I love comedic multi-choice events. I mean, I love the city and road cards as a part of Gloomhaven. Like that's that's a super fun thing. If we forget to do it, I'm like, no, we're going back because because I want to I want to get that decision. Uh, and so I think there's there's cool things to be said about taking this approach of of calling out the fun, chasing the fun, even on the Kickstarter page. Um, so really good job on that section. And it, it's kind of it is a disconnect for me that this is so good and this is so good and this isn't designed. I, I wouldn't be surprised. There's probably a reason. It, it probably is like an approachability, like from an accessibility, like um, a disabled person looking at this page that needs the text larger, or they're trying to use readers or something where they're doing this for that reason. Um, I, I think in the future we'll probably do like a white, a plain white page version that you can you can click on, um, or or have some kind of link to that you can read if you do need accessibility help. Uh, just because it 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 does break up these really nice design sections for me a little bit. All right. Continuing on that, that what's in the fun? We've got an excellent solo experience. Challenging campaign, play, challenging campaign at all player counts. That's important. So if you're playing something like Gloomhaven, they they adjust the difficulty based on the number of of players, right? It's like, all right, well, you're putting two golds down and four whites down, if which are enemy types with standees, whether they're elites or not, uh, based on the number of players. And and having that so important because you don't want it to be too easy or too hard. Like if, if it's if it's optimized just for three players, it's obviously going to suck at five because it's too easy, or one because it's way too hard. So um, it's implied, like you'd assume that's the case. But I'm really glad they called that out. Right? It's not. It's it's a good thing. It's a competitive advantage thing to call out really well. Snappy sessions with epic boss battles I means it's going to be a faster game. Um, so I'm happy that they have that. Um, so really good call out moments on this fun section here for me. Um, all right. A couple of campaigns that I talked about a few weeks ago just didn't, they were expansions or they were like second games in like a series or something. And they didn't post the the praise that they had for their last game. And that bugged me. I was like, guys, like you guys had like a, a canvas. They had a great, amazing game. And like, they didn't feature it as highly the praise that they got for me on that page. I don't think maybe it's one that did it well. Anyway, I'll have to go back and look. Uh, but, but for them, they have this, the praise for the first Valor and Villainy, right? And it's got this 8.0 on BGG and then has tons of different comments. And it, it, I love that they didn't... It's it's a really cool approach to take to not just have it be famous people, right? They've got they've got the famous big name people, they've got the, the BGG users, and then they've got the Kickstarter comments. And I love that approach because they're, they're not... It's not just like, yeah, we paid this person money and they reviewed our game and you should listen to them. It's like this person back the game on Kickstarter and they love it. This person reviewed us on BGG and they love it. And so they're really taking a large um, sample of different people to, to put as as quotes. And I like that. We've tried to do that on some of our pages where we have playtester quotes. So this is really, really wonderful. They do that on this page as well. I think my only complaint about this section um, is the ranked in top 18% games of all time. It might be a little small on your screen, but under this big 8.0, which I think is wonderful. I love the laurels. It's like, yeah. Uh, which 8.0 is a fantastic score. If you're not familiar with VGG, you're like, well, it's not 10. It's like impossible to get 10. Um, not impossible, but it's very, very hard. Um, ranked in top 80% games of all time. So the way that BGG ranks is that they not only value your, your score, which is eight, but the number of reviews you have, which is I think between three and 400 reviews for this game uh, on BGG. Um, and so they weight that against all the other games. So there are games ranked way higher then Valor and Villainy that are not ranked at an eight. They're at like a 6.7 because they have a thousand reviews and, and the system ranks it. So like, I think ranking it at the top 18% of all time uh, is a disservice to the game. Actually, I think it's probably rated a lot higher than that. Um, and so I would actually take this metric off because if you're familiar with BGG, you know that an 8.0 is great. Then I'm looking at 18% of all games. Well, there's like 50,000 games. So is this in the top 20,000? Like, or, you know, math, top 10,000 games of all time? Like, that's not that great. Uh, comparatively. So I, I think I think it's a disservice. Not a disservice. I think it's a not the metric you want to be showing here. But maybe it is. I think if it's like top 1% of games of all time, then definitely show that metric. Um, but yeah. 
Uh, really good section. All right, another like this hit one really good section after another. Good job, Skybound. Like this is just showing the scale. It's like, hey, you remember that other game that you spent this much money on? Um, look at how much bigger this expansion is, which is a standalone expansion. Look how much bigger this game is. Uh, I love how the boxes are almost the same size, if if not the same size in this photo. I wonder if the boxes are actually the same size because there's just so much more stuff going into it. It's a lot more, a um, lot more villains. They had the, oh yeah, solo and co-op one versus many. So it was a one versus many version of that. 600 cards is a ton of cards. I wonder the quality level on those cards because that is very expensive, very quick. All right. All right. So they've got this uh, creepy looking gnome pig. What is he actually? It says it up here. Hmm. I may have passed it or maybe it says it lower. He's a creepy looking dude. I really, I think you're not supposed to like that art as in it's weird and terrifying. So they nailed that. Um, the dice are dice. They look nice. They're carved. I don't think there's anything like extremely special to be said about them. All right. So now we get into the hero section on a normal minis game. This would have been super high, right? Because it's all about the minis. They didn't make this campaign all about the minis. And I like that. And I don't think it'll hurt them. I, <laughs> these are beautiful, right? Like they have this nice, like they're on a 360 spinner. It's wonderful. I, I, wish that they had this do one rotation painted and one rotation not painted and the reason is is that these look incredible and yes you could hire someone to paint that or get really good at painting and to make them look this incredible right like this is this is not facetious this is not misleading um because it says right down here miniatures supplied unpainted like they and you you know you're not getting something painted this well when you back the campaign but I think it is just a little bit, you're, you're not setting a bad expectation. It's just like, you've seen how good it can be. So when you get your version and it's just a gray mini, it's just going to be like, oh, it's not it's not as cool as it could be. Not because they did anything wrong, but just because you're not going to spend $1,000 plus getting these painted, right? And so I think I'd like to at least see them side by side, not painted versus painted, just so your expectations are set correctly. Um, that being said, the sculpts look incredible. Um it looks really, really good. Um, all right, so I got to catch up on some comments. Jacob says dice dude does not approve of the dice. The dice were fine. I mean, you're not gonna you're not gonna need really nice dice for this. It had a custom font. It was nice. Um, he's still in the first game. You haven't missed too much. I'm guessing that that's the pig guy. All right. The increased cards one of the most fun parts. They basically give everything more powers and abilities. Nice. Hey, Alex, does that retroactively go back into the older content too? Um, those cards? Because I'm, I'm curious about that. I did watch the, the final thoughts from you and Quack about this game. And I mean, it seems like you guys had a blast. So I was, I was excited, even more excited to back it at that point. Um, so yeah. All right. Going on from here. Um, all right. So I want to talk about this blackout thing. Why do this? Well, I actually think that this is a direct result from the Bloodstone campaign. And and maybe I'm wrong. And James, if you end up watching this, please correct me. But Bloodstone had a ton of content that was going to be announced across the campaign to keep excitement up, which is a, a great tried and true method of keeping excitement across the campaign, right? You come back and you're, you're like, do I want to keep this pledge? Oh man, look at this really cool mini. I do want to keep this pledge. Like there's there's a lot of benefits. That's not the only benefit. But unfortunately, it also affects your day one valuation. If there's something included in the game that hasn't been announced yet, then your day one valuation is going to be lower because you just don't know everything, right? And so by having these silhouettes, you know as a potential backer that there is more in this base game. There's nothing on here about them being exclusive uh, to like a certain... I mean, I'm, I'm sure they're in like a pledge level that includes the minis, but you know what I'm saying. Like, There's nothing on here that's like, I have to pay more for those. And it's like, come back on day two, come back on day eight, come back on day 15. And so it's a good way to, to help with that initial valuation while also have exciting unlocks as you go. So I'm, I'm think, I, I really like this. I think it's great. Uh, I think it's a good, a good happy medium for this. Um, yeah, that's, but I think that is a direct result from, from uh, Bloodstone. I'd be curious to hear what James has to say about that, but um, unsure and guards being older compatible. Thanks, Alex. I'll, I'll ask James. Um, Okay, the sidekicks. Call upon two types of sidekicks for aid, elementals, or something else. Gonna have to come back. The villains. All right, there he is. Ludwig, the, the pig dragon mech suit guy. 
his <laughs> I really don't like his face, but that mini is incredible other than his face. That's a really cool looking thing. Um, I actually really like this version of this better where you're not just having like a block of blacked out stuff, but it's like interspersed. So I think that's even better. So the villains face off against five unique villains, a Minotaur and a, that looks like a, an evil Tom Bombadil effigy of the king. Interesting. Cool. And they they do a great job. I mean, if you if you followed their other campaigns, they do a great job of world building, right? Like this is great little flavor text. Alex, did he like did did Quack like the flavor text? Did Jesse like the flavor text? It seems like a game that would have good flavor text. Um all right, so here's a good look at the minis unpainted. So that's good that they're doing that. Uh, detachable Ludwig arms. We've seen other minis with this kind of thing. It is not cheap to do. I think it's awesome that they've done that in the campaign. It looks really cool. Uh, and yeah, you just it adds more customization to the miniatures, makes them worth more in, in my valuation anyway. Um, all right, so these are stretch goals. Um, and that's at 150K. Where are we at now? They got to be getting close to, they're 120, right? Okay, so th there's a very good chance they hit that 150 today because this is their first day. Um, people are getting off of work. People are going to be checking out what's on Kickstarter. It's Tuesday. It's it's Kickstarter day, as they say. Um, but yeah. Cool, cool, cool. All right. Scale diagram. I actually really like this. We need to do this in our games. See? Every time I look at a campaign, I learn something. That's a really cool idea. I need to take a picture of that. I'm going to have to come back. Dang it. Um, all right. So how to play section. Now, we're we're not even halfway through this page, and we're at a very good how to play section. I think this is a great how to play section going through exploring the mage. It's showing that it's a modular, that you, you're you going through this maze, and it, it builds as you're going, and you're getting interesting party choices as you go. You're talking about battling minions, comboing spells, leveling up fight bosses this is hearkening back to what i said earlier about chasing the fun they, they give a little tease of what you're going to be doing in the game and why it's fun right at the beginning and then they get more into the how do you play um this is a short how to play section i do not know how to play after looking at this how to play section but let's be honest like if i want to know how to play i'm not going to read a page that's you know 30 gifts long and, and a, basically a whole rule book to read i'm going to watch a video and so I think this is a great a great halfway point uh, to meet people on. And the tutorial videos are literally the very next thing, which is wonderful. Uh, looks like they got John to do one. I don't know who this is. Cinematic preview of Valor and Villainy. Whoa. It looks very pretty. Lots of smokiness and lights. Yeah, cool video. Um... All right, play on tabletop simulator. I want to talk about this because this is new for them. They have not done this in the past. This is new for Skybound. We actually talked about this on our episode of Ivy Games Weekly. If you want to go watch that with James, um, yeah, I was. It was a hard conversation because it, it is a big choice to put all your games on tabletop simulator. And in the this day and age of pandemic and stuff, I think it is a good idea. Um, and and that world kind of changed for us. We did not release Moonrakers on Tabletop Simulator uh, when it launched. We we eventually released it after the games delivered, um, and then we launched Failed Fate on Tabletop Simulator in the middle of that campaign. Um, yeah, scale diagram is dope. I agree, Aaron. Sean says it reminds him when he's played his friend and him played Warhammer with you there. Uh, I never played Warhammer, but I had some friends that had some minis, and that was that was like a different world for me as a kid. I really wish I had gotten into it. Um, so yeah, new mechanics in each act. If you're playing the the campaign, I think that's really cool that it's changing as you're going. Um, but yeah, I, I'm just gonna blow blow through the rest of this uh, the rest of this page because it's it's what you'd expect. They've got a really good um, retail edition section here of what's in the box. Then you've got the deluxe, which is where all the minis are. Um, I love it when mini bases have something to do with something to do other than just be a base, right? I like that they have the dice living in them. This is a really cool mini. I love that bull and girl combo. That's a neat one. All right. Gotta love the game trays, guys. This is a great box breakout. We need to do something like this for our campaigns. And we just had a picture of our game tray last time. Um, but this is really, really beautiful and well well thought out. Um, all right. Got a expansion I'm going to blow through. Um, and this is the premium level that comes with the, the expansion and uh, premium plastics, which are these things here. And I think these are the 
tokens that you can add on premium plastics. All right, I want to talk about the shipping section. I'm going to skip some very nice reviews from Quack and our friend Alex. Um, but I like how they've done this. And I've talked about this on other pages where you have a quote followed by the video where the quote came from, right? Like, that's great. Uh, if you want to know what Alex said about this, improves on Minions of Mordak in every way possible. And it does so in half the playtime. I think Alex even said if you had to put him on the spot, I don't think he gave a rating yet because he hadn't played it enough times. But on the spot, he said, if I had to choose between one and the other, I'm definitely choosing this one. Um, but luckily, it doesn't seem like you have to choose one for the other because they, they kind of combine each other, combine with each other well, which is really good. Um, I really like this. This is a good way to do this. I want to do this in our in our future campaigns with the quotes followed by the videos. They have quotes throughout the page too, which is really great. Um, all right. There's the daily reveals that we talked about throughout um, and then the shipping section. All right, guys. James has gotten on. If you don't know James, James is one of the features of Skybound. Um, we talked about him on this page real fast. Dru oh, well, you can't see. It's called Druid City. Never mind. Anyway, um, he has been on Facebook a lot talking about shipping container prices, and he is not He's not wrong. They are very, very, um, very expensive right now. Shipping is a big unknown for all all project creators. Unfortunately, that means you're going to see shipping prices go up on all campaigns. And if if they don't put it up on campaigns, then they're either unaware that the costs are going to be much higher or they are absorbing that cost in another place on the Kickstarter page. So it's just backers costs are going way, or sorry, publishers costs are going way, way up. Um, it's not sinking us, uh, but it's definitely taking profit margins away in, in some cases uh, for many, many publishers. Um, and we haven't delivered, we haven't shipped Veiled Fate yet. Like we're, we're still getting quotes. Like it could come even higher than what it's coming in right now. And so it's, it's definitely a scary time, but that's why you're seeing, you know, this retail edition at 15 to 20 and this deluxe edition at 20 to 25 and a premium that's at the same, like that's in the U S like, it's just more expensive to ship these things. And, and unfortunately Amazon is, condition us all to not count shipping as an actual cost and if you're not amazon it is a huge cost i mean they're talking about twenty thousand dollars just for the container that you're putting the the boxes the the pallets in right like <laughs> that's that's not <laughs> that's not normal it's very very expensive so uh it's it's pretty messed up all right the price of shipping containers has been extremely volatile through 2021 and global resource shortages have raised production prices across the board. Because of these factors, you may notice higher shipping prices on this campaign than in the past. We hope you will understand. It's a great call out for that, right? Like this, I need to go through and just snapshot a bunch of things on this page because this is so important to, if if you are going to have a higher shipping rate, you need to tell experienced backers why. Um, and then also they have a, a shipping section on VAT. Um, collected during the pledge manager. I think that's the way to do it, especially for people in the United States. Like you just, that's the way you have to do it. Um, all right. That is that. I am a big fan. We are currently backed at the $90 level. I may go ahead and back at the 135 level, um, but big fan. I think it's gonna be very, very fun. Definitely something I can pull out um, with a group of friends. And, and it's just like, we don't have that many groups here that i can play a game like gloomhaven with i have one group i can play gloomhaven with um but like if we're gonna hang out with spouses and stuff i think this is something that we could pull out and not be as intimidating as something like gloomhaven um and yeah and 12 campaigns like 12 sessions is much more believable than 150 sessions right if you want to do the whole thing so um but yeah up to 150 dollars was that the shipping section was that rest of world? Yeah. <laughs> rest of world gets very expensive, Matt. It's, it's wild. If you know, like someone's like, I'm in Madagascar, how much will it cost to ship? And I'm like, I don't know. I'll talk to QML. And it's like, that'll be $180. You're like, okay, ship it. I guess it's luckily that a lot of people from Madagascar, I guess don't try to back games, but yep. Weird times as Matt has said. All right. I'm going to jump over to that's Druid city. Six siege. If you are a Rainbow Six fan, or really any type of, um, you know, Ubisoft shooter game uh, or Tom Clancy game, you will definitely be interested in this. This is day one. Is this day one? It's got to be day one because it's it's only got nine days. They run short campaigns, huh? I think it is day one though. Four hundred thirty-five k on the first day. Three thousand backers. It's an expensive game, um, as you can tell by the price to backer ratio. Um. 
I have not played Rainbow Six. Uh, I feel like I say that a lot when we cover video game uh, board games on here, but I am, I am kind of, I'm adjacent enough to understand the game and to understand the appeal and know that there will be a lot of people very interested based on that. Um, all right, but I did want to talk about the page because the page is wonderful. Also, this cover is so minimalistic in a good way. I really like it. I really like the iconography of the the pistol. Not iconography. I like the design of the pistol in the six. I think it's a really cool, uh, really cool touch. Um, all right, right away, let's meet the field operators, shall we? Welcome to Team Six Recruits. Um, and you got this kind of like look at what the board state will be during the game. Um, a lot of uh, just kind of like talking through the game. Um, I think this is a good intro section. Like you are, you are back in this game, not because of the miniatures, even though it has miniatures, you're back in this game, not because you've heard that the gameplay is incredible. You're back in this game, probably because you've played rainbow six siege and are really excited about the game. Um, and if they can recreate that and prove that they recreate that on this page, they're going to convert people. And considering they're 400 grand, I think they're doing just that. So let's talk about how, how this page is good at converting those people. There's a lot of text here at the beginning. Video game people are not known for being a fan of text, but I don't think it's a bad thing. You have two sections that I think are really important right at the beginning, which is kind of like setting the stage for what gameplay is like. As the attacker, you will use your explosive arsenal to tear down walls and obstacles to reach your objectives. And as the defender, you will shape the battleground to your advantage and seek to thwart your opponent's plans by denying them chances to attack. Without knowing how to play the game or without looking at the gameplay section in depth, it seems like the defender is going to get to place environmental pieces and then the attacker is going to breach, which if you've played the game, you know that breaching is a huge part of this game, right? Like that's really cool. Um, at first glance, zombicide esque, possibly very different theme, obviously, but it does kind of have that that feel on the board. Zachary said, <laughs> "Zachary, hi, Zachary." Uh, understated box design, love it. Glad I didn't miss the mark. That's what I said, and I was worried that you would watch this later in history and be like, "Oh, this is terrible." But if Zach agrees with me, then I hit it. All right, this is potentially a five out of five game for Alex. Oh, good to know. All right, I actually really like this. This is a ton of text. Like I said, like. Is someone that loves video games going to want to jump on this and read all this? Probably not. They're going to scroll right past it. But this is the art director on the project. And I, I think that's really cool that they gave him so much space to kind of talk about that. Uh, and this is art director on the, the, I believe, Ubisoft side, not on the Mythic side. Because it says, when we heard that the Mythic team were fans of Siege and were passionate about the game, we knew we had a special collaborator for this project. It was a pleasure working with the team, sharing assets and iterating on the designs. Talk about the maps. Talk about the gameplay and how they got there. Um... <laughs> it talks about games they played at the studio like wizard uno and settlers uh siege was born from a thoughtful strategic play it, it's interesting that they bring out those games because those are not games that the people that are buying this game well maybe maybe they have a broader reach than i'm expecting for for kickstarter that they're getting people that are just the video game fans to come buy it but those are not games that come to mind for for people so i'm surprised that they have that in there but it's i don't know it's it's cool that they gave a creative director and a, an art director so much space on this it's really neat um this is a wonderful thing, a wonderful thing to have. If this is your time on Kickstarter, click here and it takes you to this page and it teaches you how to do this. They are definitely expecting to get people that have never touched Kickstarter to come back this. So what I said just a couple seconds ago, throw it out the window. They are pushing with their advertising probably to get people that have never gone on Kickstarter in order to get this because that is very high. It said rookie on Kickstarter, click here, right? Got the click icon hand thing. Um, all right, rule book, mission guide here. That's pretty high for that. That is not where I would put that. I would put that with the gameplay section. Um, so this just takes you to a Dropbox link and I'm learning about the game without really seeing any of the gameplay down here. I wonder if they're going to have it again lower. Why back now? Another wonderful section that's good to have high. Free only during this campaign. You get a different operator. Um, you're getting skins in the video game. So that's pretty cool. Um, this game will likely have a retail edition. Most of the daily un unlocks are chaos exclusives and it won't be available with it. So it's a better game if you buy it now than if you have it at retail. All right, good. Uh, oh, look, Alex reviewed this one too. Alex, I did not watch your review of this one. I did not know that you had covered it. Um, making a first person shooter into a board game is hard and Six Siege does an amazing job at it by focusing on the tactical play above all else. Game is brilliant. 10 out of 10 would fail again by Jesse exactly what every fan wanted by michael king wow these are really good reviews 
All right. Let's talk about the what's in the box section and why I love it. Uh, I love that going back up here, they have tied into this, this theme that they wanted to put throughout the page and, and probably throughout the gameplay is why it's here, but the attacker defender theme, and you'll see that going down the page. So now we have it here in our what's in the box section is we have the defenders and the attackers. I might've put them on the opposite sides because it's the opposite sides up here, but you know what? That's fine. This is still really cool. Um, so you have the different kind of people facing off against each other. Um, 32 millimeter scaled minis and each unique, each mini is unique. They have cool bases, really, really well-designed minis, really cool. What's in the box section. Um, they have two maps consulate on the front and the clubhouse in the back. It's a great use of space. Most boards are one-sided, but it's actually not that much more expensive to double side them. It's actually in some cases, the same cost to put the, the same thing on the back minus the art. People asked us at the end of the campaign on Veiled Fate, they were like, hey, can you put um, a winter scene on the back of the board or like a different, like on the back, have like some kind of like different. And then we were like, that's an awesome idea, but that's going to delay going to printing by a month. That's going to be a whole different artwork piece. That's going to be many thousands of dollars to redesign this entire board. Um, and it's just sometimes not something you can do, but if you think about it for enough farther far enough in advance it is something that you can sometimes add into stuff so i think they did a really good job in in planning that um more what's in the box stuff that i'm going to skip except for oh that looks cool it's like uh there's sections that are on fire sections that are covered by smoke so that's that's neat that they have that all right lots of obstacles tables mostly it looks like some breach obstacles I'm gonna skip all of that companion application including different timer options Oh, I thought this was a product, like a, a cardboard piece that had a digital timer in it. It's a phone. It's not obvious that that's a phone. I might I might have made that a little bit different. I thought that was actually like an included component. It's a it's an app. <laughs> Companion application. Who's who calls it an application? Companion app. All right. Pledge levels. $69 is the base pledge. Um comes with one free video game skin. All right, so the, the trooper pledge is where you're getting a lot of boxes. Oh my goodness, the boxes. There's so many. Hi, Brian. No worries. Chris says, so the board game is like, a, or the board is like a bullet. Business up front, party in the back. <laughs> oh, Alex, give it a four out of five. Could grow. Skirmish is excellent. Good to know. The usual modest game from Ubisoft. You know, I heard about these guys somewhere. Uh, no, it is a two to four, Sebastian, uh, players. All right, cool. Gonna keep going. Um, base game is a reasonable price. Two hundred dollars for the next level. Is that really? Does it go from sixty nine to two hundred dollars? I might have tried to put something in between there. Sixty nine to two hundred is a big old jump. I'm not saying it's a mistake because that they will convert people to that one hundred nine level, one hundred ninety nine dollar level more than had it just been like $130 level, $125 level in the middle of those two. I'm going to think about this for a second. It's, it's a numbers game and a math game. It's just like how many people would have backed at that middle level versus the higher level and how many people are staying down at the low level instead of jumping up. And it's, it's impossible to know. It's definitely a risk to not have an in-between there, but I don't know. It's, it's paying off for them. They've got 600 backers there and 871 at the smooth operator pledge, which is $270. That is, a, that is almost as much as they have at their base game pledge. Uh, they have 929 at the base and 871 at the, the top. Um, mercy, this is a lot of stuff. It comes with a neoprene dice tray. It comes with a sling bag. <laughs> comes with plastic breach like uh breach tokens and then or plastic like breach walls and then also like chairs and tables and it looks like a pool table maybe that's wild that is huge difference though you got 69 to 269 it's a 200 dollars difference in these pledge levels and it's upgraded components and expansions are the expansions the the operators i must have missed that it says in the board game core box, there. Hmm. I wish there's a little bit more there telling me what was in this. The board game core box, all core box daily unlocks. So I think that all of the miniatures that are here might be in that core box. 
that is hard to tell what the expansions are. Hopefully they'll get into more of the expansions down here. Okay, here we go. These are all the expansions. Your one, your two, your three. That is a lot more minis. Wow, that $69 pledge is great. $70 for 20 minis. And then you're paying one, two, three, four, five. Five different five different uh, expansions. And it's $200 more. Obviously, you have different maps, so different boards. There's a lot there, but still, that's that. I, I can't tell if the base game pledge is just a really good deal or if the top tier pledges are really priced not high. I think it's worth it. It's just a big gap between. I'm not saying either, any of these pledges aren't worth it. I'm just surprised that there isn't more in between. But I guess you can get to those in betweens by backing up the fresh recruit pledge and then by just adding the the expansions and the pledge manager or even when you back the game. So interesting. Ha ha ha! More maps, more uh, more barriers, obstacles. Do right. you guys have any questions or comments on this? I think it's insanely cool. Look at that! It's got couches and safes and billiards tables. Really cool decor set. Forty dollars. So that's also in that top tier pledge. Yeah, three D decor set. Game highlights. All right. So now we're we're. <laughs> did we have a gameplay section before this? I don't think we did. So the gameplay section is pretty low, but it is. I mean, with that many miniatures and that much stuff to cover, it's hard to know where I'd put the gameplay section. I'd put it higher. I just always want gameplay higher than it is and on these kind of campaigns. Like all of the add-ons are before the gameplay. Okay. Game highlights. Lots of text, but some good gifts too. Uh, looks like the defenders are uh, inside the map and they put up obstacles and they get to place an obstacle and then hide people behind it. And then the attackers are going to to bash in the windows and doors and come in and attack. This is a really nice set. This is a really nice section of this page. Like you have a really good idea of what's going to happen when you play just from this play section. So I don't, I like the play section. I just wish it was higher. And then going back to where they called out from the whole time, like attacker, defender, attacker, defender, attacker, defender, all the way down the page, down to here. Alex, did you play the... Did you play the, the mode with the timer? I'm kind of curious at how that actually works out. All right. They jumped to adding all the expansions right away, but they're offering each expansion as add-ons. Good to know. So many boxes. I completely agree. Sean, love me some neoprene. Me too. Right there with you. Better have a big, big box. I don't think there is a big box. I think it's just the, the main core box and then a bunch of little boxes. I didn't see anything about a big box on any of these. Yep. I think you get a bunch of different boxes. But I mean, they'd all stack up nice next to each other, maybe. Oh, look, our friends again. Jesse and Alex are everywhere. Good job, Jesse and Alex. Um, all right, I'm going to skip shipping. I'm going to go back up to this how to play section because I think it's pretty interesting. Try the game on tabletop simulator. It's the norm now, guys. This game's going to be nuts on tabletop. Huh. Huh, huh, huh. All right. Oh, hey, look, it's Becca. How to play on... Hey, it looks like Game the Game's back on Geek and Sundry. I'm going to have to watch that later. Yep. Geek and Sundry's back. Good to know. All right. Tons of reviews. They definitely invested in, in getting the word out. The shipping section. Did they talk about that? Let's find out. Please note that the games shipped to these countries also include that. For the rest of the countries, you will pay import fees and or VAT on your country's regulations. The USA, European Union, Canada, Australia, United Kingdom, and Brazil will be shipping friendly. Backers from these countries will not pay import taxes. Please also note that games shipped to these countries also include VAT. For the rest of the countries, you will have to pay import fees and or VAT based on your country regulations. It appears they are saying they are paying VAT for the EU, the US, Canada. I mean, not all these countries have VAT, but well, 
not vat as in UK and in the European 20% vat anyway. Um, interesting. So they're covering that. 20% of 269 is $46, $47. Is that right? That's a lot of money. <sighs> yeah, I, it's just, it's real hard, guys. Being a publisher and paying for VAT, I think that is what that is saying. Please also note that the games shipped to these countries also include VAT. I can't tell if that means that you're going to pay for VAT or if I think it is saying that they will pay for VAT. It is $50 to ship the all-in premium to the United States, so they definitely have noticed that shipping costs are way up. $260 shipped to the rest of the world. We have a new winner on the highest shipping I've ever seen. Oh my goodness. All right, Alex has helped me out. Core is 20 minis, expansion, eight or six minis, and there are two maps and one furniture pack. Wow. Extra $130, you buy you 160 add-ons, $160 worth of add-ons to purchase them separately. Good to know. Thanks, Alex. Um, Gotta get the plastic water cooler, Aaron. <laughs> it's interesting that they were able to get uh, video games fans to pay almost the cost of a console for a single game. Meanwhile, games are flipping out. The new game is going up to $70. <laughs> You know, that is very interesting. Uh, you do kind of come back to that like movie theater. Most often when I when I see a publisher or a board game enthusiast talking about the cost of a board game, they're saying, all right, well, if you went to the movies with four people and you got popcorn, like that's $100 right there. And you, and you get in the movie once. And I totally get that. But a video game is different, right? You're paying $50 and you might pay for $60 or $70 now, right? You might play that game for 100 hours. And so like, getting a board game to 100 hours is hard because uh, it, it takes other people's schedules aligning with your own. It's not something you can just pop in and play or play with friends from the comfort of your home, right? Like you have to go somewhere and play it. Um, so yeah, I, I think that is an interesting valuation to make. That's an interesting point, Age. Um, <laughs> yes, with and without the timer, we weren't that strict the timer, but if you are, you'll feel rushed and that will give you first play, first person shooter feel. That's good to know. <laughs> Matt, man, I have less furniture at home than the expansion the game includes. That's hilarious. Uh, including that, the $69 back is a pretty good back. Yeah, what's that? Seven fourteen. Yeah, $14 plus the core pledge, $29. So what's that? Uh, it's like $198. And then you, you'd pay $20. It would be $20 VAT, but you're only paying. So it's an $80 pledge on a $100 pledge, really, if they're paying VAT for the U.S. $29 shipping on the core pledge to the United States is very high. So I think they might just be putting the VAT charges, hiding the VAT charges. I mentioned it earlier that like if they're not, if you're not paying, if you're not paying that and they are paying that, they're hiding the cost somewhere else. And $29 shipping to the United States is high, but it is a big box and there's all those shipping container problems. So I can't quite tell whether they're hiding the VAT costs in here or if they're they're just uh, assuming their, their shipping costs are going to be astronomical. It seems that $29 is quite high for their core pledge. Um, and $50 is very, very high shipping for that pledge. So it, it quite potentially is they're trying to offset some of the VAT costs by raising these, these shipping costs. Um, really great page. I think I would have put the gameplay section higher, but once again, like, and, and everyone I talked to, obviously, uh, in the, the, <laughs> the publishing world and also in the reviewing world is that minis sell. And so if you have minis, feature them high. And these are beautiful minis. They're really, really cool looking. They're based on characters from the game, I assume. Like, it's it's really interesting that even some of them have, like, extra components, right? Like, this guy's got a smoke grenade, this or a poison grenade, gas overlays. This guy's got armor panel standees. Like, they took time to customize the, the minis from a actual component standpoint, not just an ability standpoint. And I think that's really, really cool. All right. Going to move away from this, and we are going to jump into um, money. My kid will verify they played more than $100, 100 hours on this video game. Nice. Rest of world gets what instead of that. I don't get it, Matt. You're going to have to comment on that one again. All right. Um, I chose this one uh, for many, many reasons. This is not the most beautiful campaign that you will see us cover on here. Um, last season, they did 120000 On their first day, they've done 43000 and counting. So I think it's going to outstrip their last campaign. This is season four. Uh, there's been three other seasons that have launched on Kickstarter. Graphic novels, adventures. This is Van Ryder Games. If you don't know, Van Ryder is also Nashville adjacent. Um, they have been very, very helpful to IV through uh, advice. Literally had lunch with them maybe a month ago, and I was just like, please help me understand 
how many games I'm going to have to bring to this booth. How do I handle this licensing thing? All this other stuff. And they've been so, so helpful to us. So very, very thankful for Van Ryder being such good, such good friends in the space. Um, so what, we're really appreciative of them. All that aside, I would have backed this anyway. Um, this is such a fun idea. If you haven't seen them in the past, it is basically a choose your own adventure game, but it's this beautiful graphic novel. When I played choose your own adventure game as a kid, it was just plain text. It was not like this visual experience. This is just such a cool idea. And I want to talk about it apart from the idea. Like we are, we are looking at these campaigns from a publisher's perspective. Yes. I'm going to talk about things that they did are cool. I'm going to talk about things I'm excited about with the campaign, but I'm also trying to talk about like what the publisher's choices. And, and on this campaign, it really plays to its strengths. Now, it it didn't have a ton of different options as far as playing to its strengths. But for, for me, I've seen better designed pages and, and more detailed pages that didn't actually sell me on what was fun about the, the, the game, the book, whatever it is. For this, it is kind of a game, kind of a book. And we'll, and we'll kind of talk about what we'll talk about that as we go on. First off, they're very different from each other. You get five different books as a part of the campaign. You've got a fantasy theme. You've got like a, a sporty theme. You got Sherlock Holmes. You've got a space like intense, like fighting, uh, fighting book. Um, and I'm, I'm most excited about that one. Cause it feels kind of Moonrakers or Moonrakers E to me. Um, but I'm just going to jump down here. So it talks about the page is a really good example of what it will be like to, to read through this product, to, to experience this, this story. And it walks through each, each book individually and kind of gives you a taste for a, a, a scene that might happen like rats. This door is locked with some sort of, I'm not going to try to pronounce that mechanism. If you're unable to get it open, return to page 45. Like I am going to sit and look at this, this section of the book until i get that i'm not going back to page 45 i'm gonna figure this out uh and like i love that like that is such a fun like a fun moment of you know like if you can't figure it out you got to go take a step back like good luck figuring this out and it just has a lot of interesting choices and sometimes it's like multiple choices where you're going to like multiple different pages um really cool kind of just like walk through of you know the different things that can happen um and and showing you might have to jump ahead a few pages once you've made a decision um but yeah, more than half this page, the, the Kickstarter page, excuse me, more than half the Kickstarter whole page is just giving you an experience of what's going to be like in the book. And that's their biggest selling point. Their, their selling point is not going to be, oh, like we have these components because it's a book. They have really cool bookmarks and the bookmarks will add to the experience in a really cool way. And I'll show you that in a second. But I just think that it, it's a very simple page. There's not a ton of graphic design going on. It, they do a really good job of showing off the product. And I, I just feel like it, it gets missed. Like people get missed. They miss their, their key features or they miss their, their really good story in, in all of the check marks of we have to put this in the Kickstarter page. We have to put this in the Kickstarter page. And, and it's, I don't know. They have a lot of, a lot of books. That's not their first time doing this. Um, but yeah, and I think they even license these books from from another um, publisher in, in France, and then and then work on them to to translate them to, to English. I, th I don't know if all of them are done that way, or just some of them are done that way. Um, but it's a really really cool. And they just look so different from each other. Look at the art style on this one compared to the art on this one. Like it's it's just a very unique experience between each of the books. It looks like, which I'm really excited about. All right. Gonna jump through these because you can look at these on your own. I'm not gonna talk about each individual one, although Sherlock Holmes, who's not excited about that? Love Sherlock Holmes. Um, and it's just like so many clues. What will be your first decision as you attempt to unravel the mystery? So you can see there's all these different things you have to explore and you have to choose in the order in which you're going to look through them. I just I think it's really cool. They did a good job of showing off what what the actual choices are like in the in the stories. All right. Let me look at my notes here. Oh yeah, I want to talk about, of course, it is easier to show off this in this campaign than it is for other people in other campaigns because that's literally what they're selling. They're able to show you exactly what they're selling quickly, right? Like I can show you a page from the book, whereas like I can't put in a GIF the entire experience of Moonrakers. It's like the negotiation and the deck building and all that. Like I can't show you that in a frame this big without you watching a, a five minute video or two minute video or whatever. And so yes, it's easier to do it in this, but it's just important to remember for me, like, you can have all the flash, you can have all the graphic design, you can have all that stuff. But if you're not, if you're not selling the fun, going back to going back to the Valor and Villainy page, I think they did an excellent job of selling the fun right here in this this small section. 
And, and even this one, like this design doesn't blow me away. Like there is black text on white text right here, right at the top of the page. So, like I'm not like, oh my gosh, this is the most beautiful thing I've ever seen. But this section is important and great and something that a lot of campaigns don't do. They have a how to play section and they have a what's in the box section. And then you can watch some videos like, but this is, this is selling me on why I'm going to have fun. Um, and I, I also think that the graphic novel page did that really well. Where are we at? 55 minutes. I'm getting close. All right. Um, they have the complete collection here for $275 plus shipping. So they have four seasons all together, tons of books. You could literally do a graphic novel. Uh, like you would, you'd be set for a long time. Uh, if you did this, I think it's awesome that you can go back and get the whole catalog that way. Um, and the add-ons are what I want to talk about next. These bookmarks. Okay. So going to like, look through these i can't see them very well but i love that this is a thing one because everyone wants a cool bookmark to go with the book um but it also teaches you and has like reference for you it's almost like a player cheat card jesse had a, a video a couple of weeks ago about how every video every board game should have a, a player cheat card just so you don't have to completely reference the, the rule book every five minutes and it's something that's fairly low cost and something that is really, really helpful. And and I love that this is just like something that's right on a bookmark because it's so it's like a tactile thing that you're that you're constantly using while you're using. It's just helpful to like, okay, I'm gonna put this down and go help a kid. But it's also something that you're using as reference of the things you can do. Or also like tracking, I'm sure the Sherlock Holmes thing, like you're writing in clues and you're writing in things that as you experience them. So I think this is wonderful. I would never, ever back this without these. Now that I've seen it, like when I backed it, I was like, yep, getting the bookmarks. Um, and then they can also have them. They have them for every season, which is really cool. Um, yeah. Uh, they have a bunch of different quotes, a lot of different uh, Dice Tower quotes. Actually, it has a seal of excellence. Seal of excellence is is a big get. Um, that is not not something that a lot of games get. Um, and well, I mean, a lot of games have it, but it's definitely not given away for free. Like the game has to be really good for them to get that. Um, can my kids play these? I have a whole section here on what is appropriate for who there is one that is very horror film, like rated mature. Definitely don't play it unless you're an adult. They've got some teen ones and they've got something for everybody here too. So I like that they went through and did that. The dark mage on this one is a mature one. Just so you know, if you do back this, maybe don't let your kid read through that one. Don't have stretch goals. Woo. Uh, and then shipping. I wonder if they can send this media mail. I don't really know uh, what the rules are for that. Um, that would be much cheaper in the United States, at least. Um, and it is cheaper comparatively on the board. So maybe that is how they're doing that. I'm not positive about that. Um, I want to see that. All prices shown are on this project are exclusive of VAT. The VAT rates below are estimated based on the information we have on this, at the time of the campaign. It's amazing that they're able to do that. This is on books. Remember, it's different for board games, so don't go back and reference this. I can tell you that Germany's VAT is much higher than 7% on a board game, um, so it's very helpful that they are able to get a book VAT versus a game VAT, um, but this is a really nice table. It's really smart of them to do it this way. Denmark, what you doing? 25%. People need to read Denmark. Um, yeah. Look at this stand. I'm, I, don't even have a, I don't even have a retail stand or a retail store and I want I want this stand for just for my house. It's awesome. So I hope they sell a ton of those. Um, but really good job, Van Ryder. I think these are really cool. They've done these. Uh, this is not like a, it's not a new thing for them. They've done this campaign several times, but I'm really excited to, to get this and maybe some of the previous seasons. So, but I mean, yeah, they're going to hit 50K today easy, if not more. So, and I think 120K was last time. So they're going to pass that, I hope. Generally, you do about a third your first two days. A, a third in your middle of the campaign and a third your last two days. So if it, if it holds to that, and I'm not positive it will, they're probably getting a lot of return traffic that's excited and is coming back to back day one that's back to previous campaigns. Um, but if if it is holding true, then they could easily do 150 on this campaign, um, which would be a, a good increase from previous years. So cool. Pumped for them. Um, I do believe the shipping price is decent. Normally comic books are relatively more expensive compared to the big box we have in our board game community. Good to know. Big box shipping. Stan reminds me of book fairs. Yeah, at school back in the day. Totally does. Uh huh. Um, have you ever looked at rolled and told comic book series? It's an RPG and a comic book. No, but I would love to. That sounds awesome. I mean, I'm really excited about this because I think it it sounds really fun, right? Like, I, I mean, I would love to do something like this for Moonmakers. Maybe we'll talk to Fan Rider about doing something like that. But that would be such a fun a fun experience to make a, a choose your own adventure book. 
I mean, I want to make an RPG get book eventually for Moonrakers too. That would be super fun. Uh, we are not started on anything like that, so don't don't uh, ask me when that's coming. Um, but this would be so fun. The art though would be so expensive. There's so much art that goes into this, right? Like that's so many pages of different unique pieces of art. Um, so yeah. Um. All right. Cool. I think that is all I have on these three Kickstarters today. If you have any questions for me, would love to answer those now. I'm right at an hour and 20 seconds. So I am happy that I have not gone too far over. I've been trying to keep these right in an hour. Um, I am going to do a giveaway for a Moonrakers Kickstarter edition. Um, and we're going to do it in conjunction with Valor and Villainy. Uh, in previous giveaway with uh, James Hudson, we did um, Squishy Fruit from the Tidal Blades. It has the Squishy Fruit... Um, uh, components that people loved. Uh, so we did one in reference to that. So I got to find something on here that is... Uh... All right, I want you to talk about this guy. What's his name? Does anybody know this guy's name? He's in the minion section. Ludwig Fandango, genius imp, talented artificer, and ringleader in the various muscle boys demon gang. Um, I want to hear something about this guy. And whether you like him, whether you like his dragon mech suit, uh, whether it looks like your your father in law, uh, anything, all of the above, um, would love to would love to hear what you think about this guy. So you need to comment on something about this campaign. It does not to be about Ludwig himself. Something about the Valor and Villainy campaign. If you want to be eligible for next week's giveaway, it will be a Kickstarter exclusive of Moonrakers. Um, so comment on this page. I think it's a beautiful page, and it lives up with the other projects that. Um, that skybound has put out looks really fun so yeah that's it for today's show um sean says we'll totally be interested in moonraker's rpg me too uh you mean the guy the game is after thanks chris yes that's the guy that i was wondering i didn't i was looking for his his uh whether he was an imp i couldn't remember what he was technically called his his species i don't know what that would be his fantasy race i don't know what that would be but you know what i'm saying um, if you need playtest for the Moonrakers RPG that you're writing, I think I can find some peeps. Well, I, I'm not writing it, but let's do it. That sounds fun. All right, guys. Thank you so much for everything. Thank you for tuning into the show. Please comment on something with Valor and Villainy so you can get that Moonrakers Kickstarter edition. And we will see you next week. Oh, tonight. Tonight we are playing um, Foundations of Rome on TTS uh, with some people from the Discord. This is one of my favorite games that I've backed in the last year. Um, actually, I didn't back it. I ended up getting... I, I, I'm backing it kind of, quasi-backing it. But um, it is a blast. One of my favorite like uh, plot-taking games, plot-buying games. You're basically trying to buy up sections of land and then build the biggest building you can there. And then there's like some adjacency bonuses with putting other buildings next to them. Uh, I lose every time I play, but it's a blast. Um, so tune in. That'll be at 8.30 tonight. Uh, I'll post that YouTube link very soon. So yeah, thank you guys so much for tuning in. And I'll see you in, uh, uh, I guess, four hours, three hours, three and a half hours. <laughs> All right, see you then.